we've done this outline in the next couple of days. And what we want to get into now is a brief history of the political parties uh, during this time frame. And uh, I'm going to show you a few things in particular on uh, uh, this. And I, I've gotten the background of this, too. It shows you a timeline of political parties uh, and uh, the party eras. And so uh, I will be able to, you know, perhaps give you some some good information related to this. And I'll, I'll point out some things. Uh, the first political parties develop uh, out of uh, the debate for the Constitution. And you see on the left and the right here of your screen, uh, the Federalists and Anti-Federalists. Uh, those are the two groups that, that essentially become the first political party. And the Federalists just call themselves the Federalist Party. Shocking, I know. The Anti-Federalists got some good sense, though, and they decided that the Anti-Federalist Party sounds kind of jerk-like. And they called themselves the Democratic Republicans. Okay, And the Federalists versus the Democratic Republicans, uh, they are going to make up the, the first two major parties in our system. All right. And uh, I want to show you something, uh, too. When you see the parties on uh, uh, under the that Federalist side and the Anti-Federalist side, the Federalist side, OK, those people always represent the more wealthy elite people in society, whereas the Anti-Federalist represents the more common folk in society. OK, and we'll explain that to an extent as we go along. But we're just going to go over some basics today with the party era, okay? This first party system lasts from about 1796, uh, early after the Constitution's ratified and, and George Washington, uh, his first term as president. Uh, and then it lasts for a while up until the 1820s, all right? And we'll talk about why there's a change, okay? So let's first of all tell you a little bit about the two sides. And you don't need to know details, specific details about them. But the Federalists, remember, they were the side that supported the Constitution and a strong national government. We know that much already. However, there's a little bit more to them. Like I said, this group of people represents the, the wealthy people in society, the elite, the well-educated, uh, military veterans, people of recognition and renown, the people who are known as the, the upper crust of society. Okay, And these people believed that the United States needed to have not only a strong national government, but develop a, uh, a strong sense of international trade, uh, factories, manufacturing, production. That was the future uh, of the United States and that it would be a more urban future. OK, and they are very distinct, very different from the Democratic Republicans. All right. The Democratic Republicans, remember, they did not support the adoption of the Constitution because they thought more state and localized uh, control of uh, government was a better way to go. Remember, they are terrified of an overly strong national government. And these Democratic Republicans are made up more of the common folk uh, who said, look, we don't envision a society with manufacturing and trade quite as much. We envision an America that is agrarian based. And yeah, there would need to be some big cities and some urban areas and a little bit of manufacturing, but that shouldn't be the focus of what we do. Uh, these people, the Democratic Republicans, looked at America's uh, natural resources, uh, particularly the open farmland, and said, look, we could be the, the country that kind of feeds the world, uh, not to mention that it's a more peaceful approach to things. So we don't really want to get involved in the international uh, situation quite as much. We want to develop this agrarian type of economy, this uh, more simple rural way of life. And these are the more common folks in society. And so you can see that they've got clashing interests. They got different visions about what America should be. Right. And it's no different than Democrats and Republicans today. OK, so you have the Federalists versus the Democratic Republicans, and that's the first party era. Right. And these two parties compete against each other for, you know, the better part of uh, three decades, okay? But every so often here in American history, you have what are called realigning elections, or sometimes it's just called realignment. And, and what that is is, you remember when we talked about the, the first video that we had on political parties, uh, we specifically mentioned that uh, American parties are umbrella parties. It's like these groups uh, that have just enough in common to work together towards a common cause. OK, and uh, these realigning elections, 
that's when groups under the umbrellas switch sides. They realign themselves with another party or another group of some kind. And maybe it's the opposing party or maybe it's a new party altogether. But sometimes realignment occurs. And we just want to talk about uh, there, there are five what we call realigning elections that political scientists would point to in history. And the first of these realigning elections happens in 1828. Okay. And it happens in 1828 because the two guys running for president in 1828 are the same two guys who ran for president in 1824. All right. Here's what's going on. Okay. By the 1820s, the Federalist Party was starting to die out. All right. The common folk of the Democratic Republicans and the idea of kind of an agrarian lifestyle and the, the fear of over, uh, like an overarching uh, national government control of things had kind of scared people to the extent where uh, the Democratic Republicans were starting simply to be more popular. All right. They were appealing to a, a larger base of people. All right. And so the Federalist Party was dying out and Democratic Republicans were starting to win uh, most of the elections for Congress. And they actually had uh, successive presidents, uh, three successive presidents, where they were just mopping the floor with the Federalists. OK, and so here's what happens. All right. That causes a realignment. There's a break in the Democratic Republican Party. OK, there's a break. And you can see that when you look at this little graphic there, there's a change where the Democratic Republicans are going to just become the Democrats. What, here's what happens. The two guys who ran for president in 1824 are running again in 1828. And if you don't know who they are, you should look it up. Just kidding. Just kidding. I'm going to tell you. It's John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson. All right. And both of these guys happen to be Democratic Republicans. All right. But they're very different Democratic Republicans. All right. Here's the, the gist of what's going on. OK. Andrew Jackson is more of the common man. He made a name for himself even as a young man. He was like 12 or 13, and he uh, participated in the American Revolution. Uh, he hated the British. He even got a scar uh, from uh, you know fighting in that. Uh, the, a British soldier gave him a scar, which he seemed to never forgive. Uh, Andrew Jackson also had a temper. He fought uh, anybody who challenged him, and there was a running joke in society uh, that you, uh, Andrew Jackson had been in so many duels, you know, like pull your pistol at 10 paces and shoot each other. Uh, he'd been in so many duels. You weren't a real man if you hadn't been in a duel with Andrew Jackson. All right. So he's this commoner. He's very rough around the edges. Uh, he is uh, a guy who becomes a general in the uh, War of 1812 uh, and made a name for himself at the Battle of New Orleans. And so Andrew Jackson is this really rough commoner type person. Right. John Quincy Adams is completely the opposite. His dad was John Adams, a founding father, a former president. John Quincy Adams had studied abroad, well educated, one of the elite in society. And even though they're both in the same party, they have very different personalities. OK, and here's what happens that causes a split in the party. Right. The election of 1824 got really ugly. And John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson were hurling a lot of insults at each other. There was a lot of mudslinging. John Quincy Adams even trash-talked Andrew Jackson's wife and, and talked about his marriage, which was a no-no. All right? You think it's bad now. Uh, it's lucky that Andrew Jackson didn't kill John Quincy Adams in the process. Okay? Fun fact. Uh, Andrew Jackson's uh, wife had been married before, and she never uh, – like her divorce papers somehow never got finalized at the courthouse – and so technically, she was still married to the first husband uh, when she got married to Andrew Jackson. And John Quincy Adams uh, talked about not only his uh, uh, Jackson's wife, but their children and made the comment, uh, you know, implied heavily that these were bastard children, illegitimate children. And believe me, that's something that would have infuriated Andrew Jackson. All right. And so Jackson decides to run again in 1828. But this is where the split occurs. OK. People who liked Andrew Jackson, the common folk, they wanted to stick with him. And people who liked Andrew, or excuse me, John Quincy Adams, the more elite people, they bolted from the Democratic Republicans. Okay, and so Quincy Adams and his followers 
they merged with the leftovers of the Federalists, and they called themselves the National Republicans, all right? And on the other side of things, Jackson and his followers decide that, hey, we're just going to be called the Democrats now, all right? And the Democrats are going to be the ones, and that's the modern Democratic Party. They go back to 1828, where Jackson and his people said, look, it's time to make America a more of a democratic society. Uh, we need to respect the common man and what the, the hard work that they do. And that's the interest we want to represent, the regular folks. And the National Republicans are going to represent the more elite people in society, and they were organized around John Quincy Adams, who is a very well-known name at the time. All right? Now, the election of 1828, that changes everything. Fun fact, Jackson wins this one, and believe me, I'm sure he gloated about it as well. All right? And you see a change. The, the Democrats are going to be consistently that party that represents the more ordinary people in society. All right? And this is our first realigning election. Okay, that's all we're going to cover today. Real simple and straightforward. Tomorrow we'll get into a couple of other of these realigning elections, and we're probably shooting for a test like Monday-ish. All right. Uh, make sure you're working on your uh, your practice argumentative essay, and there is a discussion question online for you today, kids. Hope you're doing all right. Hang in there.